why God waits to answer. Isaiah 30. Now wait till you arrive. I hear the rustling of the leaves. It's been said here at Times Square Church, if you don't come with your Bible, you're naked. This is your clothing. Amen. Robed with his word. Verse 15. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest till ye be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength, and you would not. But you said, No, for we will flee upon horses, therefore shall you flee, and we will ride upon the swift, therefore shall they that pursue you be swift. One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one, at the rebuke of five shall you flee, till ye be left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain, as an ensign on a hill. And therefore will the Lord wait, that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore Will be exalt, he will be exalted, that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are they that wait for him. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee. When he hears your cry, he will answer thee. Hallelujah. We thank you, O God, for your precious word. Your word is our lamp, it's our strength. And I stand as a shepherd of this flock to humble myself before you, Jesus. And I ask for a special touch from heaven, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Let me speak as a shepherd does to his flock. Lord, I'm only one, but I ask you, Lord, to use this vessel this morning. Sanctify me, purge me. Let me speak the pure, holy word that will produce life. Oh, God, we thank you for your presence here this morning. You were here since we opened the service, and you're going to be here all day. Now, Lord, apply the word to our hearts. Holy Spirit, bring forth unction. Bring forth an anointing. Let the word heal us this morning. Let the word strengthen us. Let the word uh, reprove us and rebuke us if it must, only to heal us, that you may be gracious unto us. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Why God waits to answer. Now, I've read to you from Isaiah chapter 30. Don't turn there, but it goes back to chapter 29. This is during the reign of Hezekiah in Jerusalem and Judea and in, in Judah. The prophet Isaiah is contemporary at this time along with the prophet Micah. These were the two prophets that spoke during these times. If you want to know how the times were, uh, during this period that we're discussing this morning, you read the whole book of Micah and you get the picture of how Jerusalem and Judah are under judgment at this time. And Isaiah is sent by the Spirit of God to Jerusalem and the inhabitants there and God's people. And he's got a two-pronged message. First of all, he warns of a horrible warfare that was coming. And second, there was a promise of God's deliverance that they would simply trust and obey. <clears throat> the prophet Isaiah stands before God's people in Jerusalem, and he gives an awesome prophecy. He said, you're going to be going through a great test of faith, and this is all in the 29th chapter, and I'm paraphrasing. He said, there's looming before you a great test of faith. <clears throat> you're going to wake up one day, he said, and look out over the walls of Jerusalem, you're going to see the Assyrian army surrounding you. And he said, within one year, it's going to happen. You see, God always warns his people. He always warns us. And he's, the prophet Isaiah tearfully is standing before the people, and they're really being judged at this time for an apostasy. apostasy. In the city of God, the place of his anointing, where his fire fell on the altar, <clears throat> was going to come under an attack. They would be besieged. And there's going to be such uh, a, a besiegement that there would be towers raised against them where there would be bridges made so that they could uh, go from their towers right to the top of the wall. They're going to be battering rams, battering the walls night and day to try to tear down the walls of security. <clears throat> These battering rams were going to be an attempt to crush every protecting wall. They were going to go through the bread of adversity and the water of affliction. 
They said, the, the prophet said, your trial is going to become so heavy, you're going to be humbled to the very dust, you're going to lay prostrate, and the only strength you're going to have left when this battle is over is just a bare whisper. You're just going to be able to whisper. All your strength is going to be gone. Now, folks, this sounds very familiar to me. It sounds like the same kind of warning the Holy Spirit has given to us in the New Testament. It's a warning that we, as God's people in the last days, are going to go through spiritual warfare, that the devil's going to come. You wake up one day and you're surrounded by enemies. You wake up one day and you find yourself in a battle for your life. You find the devil coming with his battering rams and his towers and bangs and hits, and everything out of hell comes against you. And there are people sitting among us here this morning in the balcony, main floor, around me, surrounding me. You don't know who they are. I don't know. Only the Holy Ghost does. He's the mind reader. And he knows exactly what you are going through this morning. He knew that all week, and he prepared a message for many of you. Some of you are visitors. God sent you here this morning to deliver you, to bring you into a new realm of discovery in the Spirit. He's going to help you this morning. If you just say right now, Holy Spirit, open my ears to hear. If you're sitting here this morning and your mind is wondering, bring it to captivity. Every thought to the obedience of the Lord Jesus. Because the Holy Spirit is faithful to his flock. He is faithful to his people. Folks, we serve a loving Heavenly Father who wants nothing more than to deliver his people. He's called a deliverer. He is a deliverer. And that's what he has in mind for you this morning. Suddenly, some of you have been cast into the trial of your life. You're being tested in your faith. And some of you have been so overwhelmed, you've literally been crushed and humiliated. And you get up each day and you wonder if you can go on. There's a doctor in this church, a fine man of God, and just recently he was sued. And... Uh, taking a stand for the Lord and going through it. And he said, Brother Dave, every day I wake up, there's something new. There's something worse. There's always another evil report. I am being battered. I'm at my wit's end. I got a letter. Uh, you know, we receive uh, thousands of letters from our mailing list that our messages are sent all over the United States and around the world. <clears throat> and this week, a letter came to me from a sister in the Midwest. And she said, Dear Brother David, I attend a Holy Ghost-filled church. I've grown more in the past two years than in all my past life. But for the past six months, I've been going through a fiery trial of my faith. And I don't think I can take much more. Why does everything have to be so hard? I have met the devil face to face. And it seems like he hits me in some different way every day. Every day there's another evil report. He's been robbing me financially. He's trying to discourage me, so I'll quit. I've become so weary. It shows on my face and now in my attitude. Every day just brings more pressure. Why can't things settle down for a while? I bind Satan. I praise the Lord all times, but it seems to be to no avail. I know the word is true. I'm listening all day to godly tapes, but I can hardly make it through the day anymore. I'm so tired trying to be strong. I'm at my wit's end, and I really don't know what's happening. And we get letters like that from all over the world, people going through the test of their life. The prophet Isaiah sees this uh, <clears throat> message from the Lord. He hears the voice of the Lord, and he said, even though I warned you of what's going through, even though I have warned you, <clears throat> I'm telling you that God, if you'll trust him, is going to bring you through miraculously. God is going to deliver you. You're going to be surrounded by armies. You're going to have battering rams, battering at your walls. You're going to go through such a test that's going to bring you finally prostrate on your face in the dust where you can only whisper, but I'm telling you now, you don't have to do anything about it. You're going to just trust the Lord, and he's going to carry you through. And one day, in his time, every enemy will be gone. And it'll be just like a bad dream that passes away. <clears throat> he gave, in, in chapter 29, there are eight verses. The four first, four first verses of chapter 29 are all woes. What you're going through. 
Folks, hasn't the Holy Spirit warned us that we're going to be in spiritual battles? Hasn't he warned us that we're going to go into a fiery furnace? He said, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. But he said, what's happening to you is common to all of God's people. But God will in his own time and his way make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Even though he warns us, he said, in the last days we'll be persecuted. We will be tried. And just when you think your strength is going to fail, when you're at your lowest, when all seems hopeless, at the peak of your crisis, the Bible says, God will take over. <clears throat> you read 29, Isaiah 29, verses 5 to 8. And oh, what, a, what tremendous promises are given here. Moreover, the multitude of thy strangers shall be like small dust. The multitude of the terrible ones. And in fact, in Hebrew, those very important people who come against you shall be as chaff that passeth away. It shall be as an instant, suddenly. Thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunder and with earthquake and great noise, with storm and tempest and the flame of devouring fire. And the multitude of those that come against Jerusalem, her aerial, even all that fight against her and her, mul- and her munitions and that have distressed her shall be as a dream and a night vision. And here's a wonderful promise. God says, the multitude of your enemies shall become like fine dust. The multitude of the ruthless, like the chaff, shall blow away. The Lord will visit upon your enemies, is what he's saying, with thunder, with earthquake, with great noise, with storm and tempest, and a devouring fire. And you know what the prophet is saying? Very suddenly, when you think it's hopeless, when you think you can't go another step, suddenly, suddenly, the Lord shall come with thunder and lightning and earthquake. The Assyrians who have schemed to destroy you will themselves be put to shame. And that's all through chapter 29 and also the first part of chapter 30. He said they're going to wake up into a delusion. They're going to have empty souls. The devil's plans and schemes will fade away like a bad dream. God will lift you up out of the pit of despair. And everyone who's come against you, wait, warred against you, shall be consumed with his voice. They will no longer distress you, and the dream will pass, and you will come into his glory. And you will come into the increase of bread, the scripture says. Your bread will be increased. It means the blessing of God. Folks, we today have even greater promises than they had. Scripture makes it very, very clear that we live in a time of greater promises. For he hath obtained a more excellent ministry by how much more he is the mediator of a better covenant which is established upon better promises. We have all the promises Jerusalem had, and we have all the promises of the New Testament. Yes, God has warned you. He has warned me. He has warned us all that there are times that come that are going to test the very righteous. And I want to tell you, and I want you to hear me well, the more righteous you are, The closer you walk to Jesus, the hungrier you are for him, the more you seek his face, the more you are going to be tried and tempted and tested as no other Christian. Dear sister on our mailing list, this is, uh, send us this note. Dear brother David, I feel that of the Lord to send you these encouraging words from Brother Frangipani's book, The Three Battlegrounds. And I want to read just a paragraph. And, and here's what it said. In these closing moments of this age, the Lord will have a people whose purpose for living is only to please God with their lives. You know there are people like that. Their only purpose for living is to please God. You know the price that kind of person is going to pay? In them, God finds his own reward for creating man. They become his worshipers. Oh, thank God for worshipers. If you are a true worshiper, watch out. They are on earth only to please God, and when he is pleased, they are pleased. The Lord takes them farther and through more pain and more conflicts than other men. Outwardly, these people seem to be smitten of God and afflicted. Yet to God, they are his beloved. When they are crushed like the petals of a flower, they exude worship, the fragrance of which is so beautiful and rare that angels weep in quiet 
at their surrender. One would think that God would protect these who worship. He would guard them in such a way that they would not be marred or broken. Instead, they are marred and broken more than any other men. Indeed, the Lord seems pleased to crush them, putting them to grief. For in the midst of the physical and emotional pain, their loyalty to Jesus Christ grows pure and more perfect. In the face of persecution, their love and worship toward God becomes all-consuming. Folks, that's the purpose of suffering. That's the purpose of being tried, that God may bring us to a place of sweetness, a place of rest, that we can come to this, he said, in, in quietness and confidence shall be your security, that you're secure because you have test, you've been tested of the Lord and you didn't murmur, you didn't complain, you didn't quit, but you grew in Christ. It produced the nature of Christ. It produced the beauty of Jesus in you. That's why some of you are going through it. You can't understand it. But Pastor Dave, never have I loved him more. I've studied, I've wept, I've cried, I've prayed. I walked circumspectly before God. Why am I going through the trial that I'm going through? Some of it is financial for some of you. Some of it's children. Some of it's family. Some of it's physical. I don't know what you're going through today. Is it your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your, your children? Is it just your own physical pain? What is it you're going through? I don't know, but he does. But he said that's common. That is not to be considered something unusual. And if God doesn't deliver you immediately, I can tell you one thing. He'll give you all the grace you need to see it through. There was a persistent woman who cried night and day for justice and a vengeance. She kept coming to the judge. And the judge said, because she bothers me, I'll answer. But the Lord Jesus himself, and shall not God avenge or protect his own elect, which cry unto him night and day, though he bear along with them. I tell you, and this is Jesus speaking. Jesus, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. God said, make sure you understand that the Lord will fight your battles. The Lord will do it. Now, beloved, Jesus was the fulfillment given to all the prophets of the promise. You read about the promise all through the Old Testament. That was Jesus. That was the Messiah coming. It was given to all the prophets. I want you to go to Luke, please, the first chapter of Luke. I'm going to use something to give you great encouragement. It's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Luke 1, beginning to read verse 68. You should read this every week or every time you're downcast. Luke, the first chapter. Chapter, beginning read, uh, verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. This is <clears throat> Zechariah speaking. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Who is that power of salvation, that horn? Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hallelujah. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from what? Our enemies and from the hand of how many? All that hate us. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being what? Delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him. How long? All the days of our life without fear. All the days of our life, God dealing with your enemies in in your household, your enemies on the job, your enemies on the street, demonic powers, principalities and powers of darkness, whatever it may be that comes against you, the Lord says, I will deliver you from all your enemies so that you live out all your days in peace and rest in the Lord. I want you to go to Isaiah, back to Isaiah 30. The 30th chapter of Isaiah again. 
You see, God comes to Jerusalem with these wonderful promises. He said, if you'll call on me, I'll hear you. You'll hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it, when you turn to the right or to the left. He said, if you'll simply call on me, I will hear you, and I will answer you. And he said, I will deliver you, and I'll handle all your enemies. <clears throat> but the scripture makes it clear that Israel, or rather that Jerusalem and Judah, did not listen to the prophet, did not listen to the word of God. And the scripture says they panicked, and they did not consult the Lord, but they had their own committee meetings. They met in private, and they said, who sees it? God doesn't see it. And they counseled among themselves, and they did not call on the name of the Lord. They didn't seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit, but they turned to the arm of the flesh. They got on swift horses and sent ambassadors to Egypt. They went to Zoar and, and, and to Haines, and they sent their ambassadors on swift horses, and they turned to the arm of the flesh. Look at chapter 30, verse 15, if you will, please. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. And they say, who seeth us, and who knoweth us? Chapter 30, uh, no, that, that's uh, chapter 29, 13. I want you to uh, go to chapter 30, verse 13, 15 again. This is chapter 30, verse 15. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest... Shall ye be saved in quietness and confidence shall be your strength and you would not. Now, folks, look at me, please. This is the prophet Isaiah standing before the people. He said, the Assyrians are coming within a year. And he said, all you have to do is stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. All you do is cry out to the Lord and he will come and deliver you. And while they're gathering around you, while all this turmoil is around you, you're going to have your mind at rest and peace. And that's going to be your strength. That's going to see you through if you'll just take my word. But he said, you would not. You would not listen to that. You wouldn't take it. They panicked. And they said, no, we want to see action. The Lord works too slow. Oh, isn't that just the way we are? God has made us great and precious promises whereby we're made partakers of his divine nature. You know the hardest thing it is for a Christian or a child of God to do is to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. We want something to happen. So we get on our swift horses just like Israel and we run down to Egypt. Egypt is flesh. Egypt is man-made methods. You see, the Bible says that the Holy Ghost is our comforter. And, whether, and rather than accept that and rest in that, we run to our friends. We get on the telephone. We look for some human comforter. Who do you run to in your bridle? Who do you go to? Who hears your ear? Do you run to the Lord or do you immediately pick up your phone? You say, I've got a good friend. This friend has to, this friend will help me out. The Bible says Jesus is our healer. And rather than rest on that, we run to our doctors, we run to our hospitals, we run to our experts. We really don't trust the Lord. You and I know that. When we are in battle, when we're in trouble, we run to some counselor, we run. We have, we have Christians now that just go to the Christian bookstore. Look at all the people lined up on the how-to books. How to find happiness, how to solve your loneliness problem. There must be 10,000 books on how to, to overcome loneliness, written by lonely people who don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> they're trying to solve their own problems. God said, if you will seek me, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it, when you turn to the right hand and turn to the left. All God said, Israel, or Judah, Jerusalem, Judah, will you just lean on me? Folks, I'm telling you, we don't do that. Somehow, this has to get into your heart. I've stood in this platform, in this pulpit, this past year especially, I've been looking back over the messages I've preached and the notes. Folks, I have preached more on this subject than any other subject this past year. Brother Carter has stood here and others have stood here trying to get us to believe God. 
not to lean on the arm of the flesh and to rest in his promises. It has been coming at us time and time again. And God must know, he must know, and I know he does, that many of us have been grieving him because I can preach the kind of message I'm preaching this morning about just trusting his word and leaning not on the flesh, but leaning on his word and his promises. And people will come up to me and say, Brother, that was a good word. I can meet him out on the street. Boy, that was good. Boy, Lord, touch me. That's Sunday by Wednesday. The trial is raging around them and you thought I hadn't said a word about trust. Everything they heard Sunday morning or Sunday night, they've forgotten. And they're on the telephone. They're in panic. They're on their swift horses running to Egypt. And I'm telling you, that wounded the heart of God. God was wounded. He's grieved. Because rather than being in a secret closet pouring out their hearts, they're then sitting in the council rooms with the Egyptians who were heathen worshiping idols. And they're pouring out their heart to these Egyptian lords. These very Egyptian lords that God once wounded and destroyed. The posterity of these people. And here they are with their seed sitting down in these council rooms saying, Look, the Assyrians are coming against us. We're going to be in the battle of our life. We are weak. We can't stand it. We will pay any price if you'll come and protect us. What does, how does the heart of God feel when his own children, having all these promises, turn away from him and run on swift horses to the camp of the Egyptians and they're unburdening and unbosoming themselves to these men? And God said, it's a shame. He said, they can't help you. And the prophet is incredulous. He can't believe their blindness. He said, you've, you've lost your discernment. Woe to the rebellious children that go down to Egypt and have not asked at my mouth. And they go to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. And the prophet comes along and he said, you know why you don't hear the word of God? For the Lord's poured out upon you a spirit of deep sleep and he's closed your eyes. You so many times trying every battle has been a test. He's tested you and tested you, failed and you failed and you failed. And here they are at an ultimate test. Folks, I want to tell you something. If you've never heard anything ever been preached in this pulpit before, listen now. Listen to a pastor who's learning. I'm sorry I had to wait till I'm this age in my 60s to learn some of these lessons. But you can preach this gospel all your life. You can talk about faith. You can preach it. You can preach about trusting the Lord. But I want to tell you, it only comes through trials. It only comes through tests. And I wish I had learned in some of the former tests that I wouldn't have to be tested so severely at this time in my ministry and my age that I would have to go through such, such severe testing till I finally learned this lesson to just step back and trust God and call on his name and let him take care of everything. I have learned in a time of slander and abuse to stand still and see the salvation of God and not try to defend myself for the house of God. I used to be a fighter. There was a time 10 years ago, before I came to New York, you ever touched me? You came near me. You'll pick yourself up off the street. Bless God, I'm a prophet. I didn't say that, but I felt it. You touched me and you're dead. No, folks, that's all gone. And you know why? Because in the test, you're not to retaliate. You're not to take the battle in your own hands. You don't sit around questioning, is God doing this or the devil doing this? It don't matter. If he's chastening you, he said, blessed are you, whom the Lord loves. You say, well, God, you must love me an awful lot to test me like this. But some of you are not there yet. You're still fighting. 
somebody talks about you on the job, start a rumor, you go start another one. You're going to retaliate. You're going to get even. That's not the Christ way. The test you're going through, you're going to sit around. When, when do you stop complaining and say, oh God, where are you? Why are you doing this to me? Lord, I've never loved you more than I do. Why, 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 why? That's the only word some of us get out of our trials. And the hardest thing to do, and I'm telling you this, and it's the only way, is to rest and stand still and say, God, teach me the lessons I want to learn. Open my mind. Open my heart. There's so much that he wants to teach us. You say, well, Brother Dave, I've been walking with God for 30 years. Well, folks, I've been walking with God longer than that. And as a pastor, I'm still learning. You're going to learn too. Forget how long you've been walking with God. I know people walk with God 50 years and they're still babies. They've learned hardly anything. And they don't understand why the Lord keeps testing and trying them. Hallelujah. God was greatly offended when they panicked and rushed down to Egypt. God calls it outright rebellion when we refuse to, when we refuse to rest on his promises. Woe to the rebellious children that take counsel but not of me. They've not asked at my mouth. They depend on horses and they trust in chariots because there are many, but they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither do they seek the Lord. <clears throat> Beloved, all through the Word, we have been warned that we're going to go through this, and that God tells us that if you're a true worshiper, you're going to be tried more than anything else. But the truth is, the majority of God's people do not rest on the promises. They don't. Now, God saw this feverish activity going on. He saw them rushing down to Egypt. Can you see their ambassadors and their princes? They've got swift horses, and they're all excited. They're going to work out their own problem. Go ahead, get on your swift horse. The Bible said the horses that are following you are just as swift, and you can't outrun your problems. There's no place on earth you can outrun what you're going through. Wherever you go, it's still there. Because the horses, the Bible said, that after you are swift as your horses. Just about you think, oh, that's all over. You turn around, there it is. Still following you. No, you can't outrun your problems. And, you, and, and these men panic. They're trying to outrun their problem. Look now with me. I, and here's the heart of my message. Verse 18, chapter 30. God looks down. At it, and he says, and therefore will the Lord wait, that he may be gracious unto you. I'll wait. Look at me, please. God says, okay, you don't need me right now because you're so busy doing it yourself. I'm just going to wait. I want to be gracious. I want to hear you. I'm ready. I, I have a plan. I'll do it my time and way. I'm testing you to see if you just sit and wait and rest. Get off your horse. But he said, and this is the reason why God has not answered many of you. Because you're still so busy trying to work it out. Figure it out. And Lord said, okay, I'm going to wait till you exhaust all your human effort. I'm going to wait until you completely are exhausted and say, well, to whom shall I go? That's where he wants you. Where you are hopeless in the flesh. There's no man, there's no woman, there's no program, there's nothing on the face of the earth is going to help you. And you say, all right, God, I quit, I resign. You do it, you do it. <clears throat> David said, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. And my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my sorrow before him. I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. God said, come on to me now. 
and pour out your soul. Tell me what you've tried. I understand. I've followed you. I've watched you. The Lord said, wait. I'll wait till you're exhausted. I'll wait till you're tired of trying to figure it out. And you just, you just fall back and say, God, it's absolutely beyond me. I can't fight it. I can't do anything about it. I can't change it. I can't, my finances, my family, Lord, it's there. It's been thrust upon me. I have to just endure it, but oh God, you're going to have to give me strength. You have to figure this whole thing out. And the Lord said, Let, let's, let's go on. Hallelujah. He said, I'm going to wipe away your tears in the next verse. For the people that dwell in Zion at Jerusalem, thou shalt weep no more. For he will be very gracious <laughs> unto you. Uh, he was very gracious unto thee at what? The voice of thy cry. And when he shall hear it, he will answer thee. <clears throat> the first message, uh, uh, it was the second message I heard Pastor Carter preach. When a cry becomes a prayer, is that it? And that's when I got on my car phone and called him to come down here and preach, which led to his being here. And I know he preaches this, and I know how diligent I preach it. But folks, somehow, by the Holy Spirit, it has to find its mark today and change us as a people. God cannot build a strong church on people who are not convinced that God is on their side, that God sees and knows all, and that he alone, by faith, to those who call and cry to his name. Folks, I don't do anything anymore. Anything that comes my way, you know where I go? I don't get on the phone. <clears throat> I don't call Pastor Carter. I don't call any pastor anywhere on the face of the earth. I don't even sit down and talk over with my wife. I love her, but I, I don't take my problems to her. <clears throat> my wife, I love her. She, she can't touch that space in me. She can't help me there. She can't heal me. We can encourage one another, but it doesn't touch that spot. And so I go into my study and I shut the door. Or I go out, get in my car and go to Pennsylvania and go up on a mountain. And I'll spend three or four hours just walking and crying my heart out. I unburden my whole soul. I tell him everything. I weep, I cry, and I say, God, you said and I use this very verse, you said, when I cry, you'll hear me and you'll deliver me. And I'll tell you after, when I come out, when I come out of that secret closet or when I come away from that walk with God, <clears throat> there's something inside of me that can settle on this in quietness and confidence is your strength. There is strength that comes. God reassures you. Then you're not looking to the arm of flesh. You don't have to call anybody. You don't have to talk it over with anybody. That doesn't mean you're a law to yourself or that you're just a loner. But then when you come out, you're talking faith. You're talking God's on the throne. You're not trying to figure anything out. But folks, God has waited and waited sometimes on me. And He's going to stand by and wait. You can, you, you can, you can pray for eight hours a day. You can seek God with all, all that you are in the flesh. You can read chapter after chapter after chapter. You can read whole books. You read the whole Bible. But if you don't have faith in His promises, in His Word, nothing's going to happen. For the Egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose. And they shall be to you a shame and a reproach. You turn to the flesh... It ends in nothing but shame and reproach. But oh, I love this. He will be very, not just gracious, but very gracious to you at the voice of your cry. And when he hears it, he will answer thee. All right, before I close, now go to chapter, uh, chapter 30, verse 20 and 21. And the, the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction. How many of you are going through that right now? Bread of affliction? Water of trouble? Where's your hand? Am I preaching to myself? I said, how many of you are being tested and tried? Raise your hand. Quit hiding. 
Well, there's still some of you hiding. <laughs> I'll tell you what, if this, doesn't, if this doesn't apply to you today, get the tape by Wednesday it will. <laughs> Verse 20, and though the Lord give you the bread of adversity, who gives it to you? The bread of adversity, the water of affliction. Yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner any more, but then I shall see thy teachers. And folks, you know what this is? This is revelation. This is, who, who is our teacher? The Holy Spirit. These are revelations of the Holy Spirit. We'll never, won't be hidden to you anymore because you're trusting in the Lord. They're going to be revelations of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to guide you now. He's going to lead you through. He's going to tell you how and what to do. Sometimes you just say, stand still. Don't do anything. And then he will give you direction. There'll be a revelation of who God is, who Jesus is. And you'll be standing there, but you won't be standing still. You'll be learning. There'll be a process of learning. Your teacher will not be hidden anymore. Nothing will be hidden from your eyes. You'll be learning. Verse 21. And thine ears shall hear word behind thee saying, This is the way walk ye in it when ye turn to the right hand. And when you turn to the left, he said, I'm going to make your path clear to you. You're going to know and understand. And folks, I don't have time. You go through the rest of the chapter and it's all about how God's going to bless you and prosper you in the, in the spirit of Christ and the glory of God, how he's going to lead you and give you the bread of increase. Hallelujah. He's on the throne. He's not going to fail. Some of you need a baptism of faith this morning. You need to quit figuring things out. Some of you haven't slept good for a long time. God wants to give you a Holy Ghost sleeping pill today. <laughs> that you can go to bed tonight and rest and say, Lord, you take it from here. Will you stand, please? Now, beloved, look my way. I've been in the ministry long enough to understand that God doesn't speak like this unless he has reason. He knows what he's doing. The Holy Ghost knows what he's doing. If I'm convinced of anything, it's that. And he's trying to accomplish something in your heart. First of all, I want you to know if you're going to seek God with all your heart, you've got today to settle this matter. You're going to be attempted. You're going to be tried. You're going to be tested. You're going to be persecuted. How many understand that now? The closer you get to God, the more fierce it can get. I tell you what, though, the Lord won't keep you in that condition. He comes to deliver. But do you understand now the reason why he waits to answer? He's waiting for you to quit figuring it out. He wants you to quit running around trying to solve your own problem. He wants you to just give him simple childlike faith and say, Jesus, everything I'm in right now is beyond me. And I know some of you need strength. It's not that you doubt the Lord. It's not that you uh, have any intention of ever leaving or wounding him. But in the flesh, you're weak. Some have only been saved a year or two, maybe. You don't understand. It may be that everything's going well, but something inside. The enemy comes at your faith. He comes at you. He comes at your family. He comes with worry. He comes with fear. And those are the battering rams of the enemy. Fear. Guilt, condemnation, and so many things. He just batters and batters and batters. What are you going to do? Are you going to panic? Or are you going to stand on his word? He said, I'll make a way of escape. I will. I'll keep you from falling. And I'll present you faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. I will. I will. I will. And that's what faith rests on. Oh, God, you do it. I'm telling you, I stand here now because he's brought me out. 
He has delivered. He brought me into his banqueting house and his banner over me is love. Hallelujah. God wants to bring everybody in this church this morning out of your pit of despair. He wants you to walk out of here with a song in your heart, joy in your step. Having committed everything to him, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. I want, first of all, the first invitation up the balcony here on the main floor, those first that are going through a severe attack. You'd have to say, I'm like the children of Israel. The enemy has surrounded me. The battering rams are on me. And I, I have just been tried and tested as never before in my life. I'm really going through it, Pastor Dave. I want you to get out to your seat first. Balcony, go to either uh, side of the stairs and come down any aisle. I want to pray that God this morning give you a great victory. That He'll lift this burden from your heart today. <clears throat> if you're backslidden, if you're not right with Jesus, come and follow these that are coming. Say, I, I, need, I need to come back to my first love for Jesus. Maybe you've never been right with God. Come and make it right right now. God will deliver you. Please move close. And move in close because there will be a lot of people coming. All right? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You that are standing here, that came forward, Holy Spirit just spoke something in my heart. I don't think we realize how serious and how, uh, what a storm some of you are going through. I'm going to ask a question I feel led the Holy Spirit to ask. And this is not to be showy or anything else, but to show how serious it is for some of you. How many of you have gone through it so badly lately? The enemy's even whispered to your heart, there's no purpose in living. You might as well take your life. Raise your hand, please. Raise it high. That's what I thought. That's why the Holy Spirit laid it in my heart. Have you been coming here for how long? Nine months? God's going to give you a great deliverance this morning. That will never come again. Isn't the Lord wonderful that He knows what you're going through and He prepares a precious word just to lift you out of that. And it reminds you how much He cares. Huh? Isn't that wonderful? Now I'm going to come against these lying spirits. I'm going to speak the word of faith. I'm one of His shepherds. He's anointed me for this. And I want you to know, I want you to believe the Lord, but I want you to believe with me that as I pray, God's going to break the hold of this lying spirit that's trying to bring you down. The devil only holds you through lies. Once the lie is broken, once it's exposed, he has no power, he has no authority. <clears throat> Hallelujah. I want you to just lift both hands. You don't have to weigh up. Just, just, that's, Lord, I surrender. Father, in Jesus' name, I come against every principality and power of darkness. I'm asking you, Father, to bind and rebuke every lying spirit, every lying spirit that has come against the children of God and those who have been cold and backslidden, those who are going through trials and temptations. You're the great deliverer. And I speak the word of faith right now that you break these chains. Every demon power, you're commanded to depart in Jesus' name and go your way into the abyss. Go your way. Break these chains, Father, by your Holy Spirit. Lord, give us your word now. And speak clearly to our hearts. Lord, we need you. We need to hear from heaven, and we're trusting you now in Jesus' name. Amen. First Peter. Fourth chapter, First Peter, the fourth chapter. Getting ready for the end of all things. First Peter, the fourth chapter. <clears throat> I'm going to read just a few verses. 
Uh, start in verse 7, please. First Peter 4, beginning of verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Now, that's pretty blunt. He gets up before his people, or and in his letter he writes, the end has come. He said, and be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Thank you, Jesus. Now, uh, in Second Peter 1.14, he has just announced, the Lord has shown me that I'm going to die. The Lord has shown me that my time has come. And so he comes to the people now as a dying man. He comes as if to say, I'm soon going to be with my heavenly father. I'm soon going to be with Christ. So I'm going to give you my final word. He said, I want you to know the end of all things is at hand. It's right at hand. You say, well, that was written 2,000 years or so ago. But folks, if, if it were true then, it's all the more true now. At the end of the very last of the last days. And he said... I'm going to tell you what God expects and what he wants of you. I'm going to tell you how to become secure. I'm going to tell you how to prepare for the end times. And you see, he says nothing about the economy. He says nothing about the loss of houses and lands. He says nothing about uh, where to put your money, nothing about safe havens. And he comes with this, and, and uh, I, I got a letter from somebody, uh, read one of my prophetic books about how God's going to keep his people in the coming depression. And he said, I wrote to you, <clears throat> Pastor Dave, in good faith, and I believe that you're an honest, righteous man, and I ask you where I should put my money, uh, some safe place to put my money, because he said, really, if God's warning us, he wouldn't be a very good God if he didn't tell us how to survive. And he was trying to put me on the spot, and he said, I, I want to know. I don't want any theological uh, cop-out. He said, that's what you preachers do. You cop out and just say, go pray, because that's what I told him. Pray and get the mind of the Holy Ghost for yourself. And he, he said, I feel cheated. He, he said, I, I wanted to hear... Certainly, God would have a word. He would not warn us unless he gave us a way to survive. And I get letters like that. And already since I mentioned my topic, how to prepare for the end of all things, uh, some of you feel like, well, uh, Brother Dave, this, as soon as I announce this subject, well, Pastor Dave is going to give us some good advice on uh, where to put our money and help us get fixed for the hard times that have already started. And that, that's a good, honest question. We all ask those questions. But folks, uh, this is not going to make sense to you until we get to the last half of the message. And you'll see why Peter goes with this message. As he, he says, first of all, be sober. In other words, don't panic. That's his first advice. No matter what happens. And there's many Christians right now in panic. Who have, who have believed and testified all their lifetime that the Lord was their keeper. We sing Jehovah Jireh. We sing all these wonderful songs about how good God is and how he's going to keep us in the hard times. And it, there is a human nature in us that responds, and we, we have to bring it under the word. We have to bring it under the control of faith. But he's saying, be sober, first of all. Be sober. And then second, he says, go to prayer. He said, you, you wonder why you're confused, you wonder why you're in turmoil, you wonder why you're in panic, and you're not sober in these times. And he's saying the worse it gets, the blacker the night, the more you're, you should be walking in soberness and the peace and the rest of the Holy Ghost. That's what he says, as hard as that sounds, that is, that's what I'm telling you God told me before he takes me home. I'm telling the church of Jesus Christ in my day and in the days to come. 
There are going to be hard and difficult times. And Peter describes those times. Mockers and scoffers are going to come. There are going to be those preaching deception in our churches. There are going to be preachers of covetousness and materialism. He goes on to describe all of those things that are coming. And he says, don't panic. Be at peace about it. And then he says, go to prayer. And folks, that, there is where I go. Every time fear tries to rise in my spirit. Every time there's another news report that seems to just uh, uh, be overwhelming, I go to the Lord. I go to my knees. And that's the answer to all the stress problems. I just saw in the Wall Street Journal yesterday that all over Wall Street now, they have a whole hour. And, and many of the corporate leaders are, are into yoga and in, into Chinese mantras. And they're trying to calm their stress. And it, in some offices now, it's mandatory that you go and take yoga so that you can uh, calm yourself. Well, folks, we have a savior. We have a promise. And we are going to be a testimony that we know how to handle stress. We've got a little room we go into. It's called the secret closet. Tell that to the world. Here, here's the world, here's the world uh, looking at crystals, hoping beams will come out of those crystals. And, and there are people doing yoga and quoting uh, Chinese mantras that they don't know what it means. Um, <laughs> then, then you tell them you've got a secret closet where you go and you come out strong. And they're going to say, you're crazy. You're stupid. What do you mean a secret closet? Well, what do you know about yoga? I've, I've got somebody that takes all my stress away. <laughs> King of Kings. I meet him right in that. You mean you meet God? Yes. We meet God in the secret closet of prayer. And then he, he goes on. He, he said in verse 8. And above all things, above all things, above all preparations, above everything you think about how to survive in the end times. He said, I'm going to give you word and this, this is the issue. And you have to deal with this. And, and this is mind boggling at first. He, he, he says, above all things, have fervent on fire mercy and love for your brothers and sisters. He said, what are you saying? You're not, if you want to really know what survival is about, if you know where God is taking his people, you have to have this unconditional love for your brothers and sisters where race has no, uh, there's, there's no barrier in race. No one said this church has over a hundred nationalities of all colors and all nations. And I, I want you to know this church is under attack for that very reason. Many times it would not be under attack if it were just all white or all black or all Hispanic. There are churches like that and thank God for them. But this is a special thing that God is doing here in New York City and has done. A hundred or more nationalities loving one another <laughs> without racial prejudice. And, and this is what the apostle says. Peter says, this is the issue now. That there is a love. There's a, out, out in the front. It says uh, Times Square Church. The church that love is building. It doesn't say the church that loves its building. It says the church <laughs> that love is building. Hallelujah. He, he, he says. The reason for this is because. This kind of love. Covers a multitude of sins. It covers a multitude of sins. Now, here's the issue. And I want you to listen very, very closely. Paul said, if you want to be ready for what God is going to do, because I'm going to show in just a minute that in the end times, and I've already told you, I gave away my secret before I started to preach. There's coming a latter rain of the Holy Spirit. And we're, going to, we're going to go into that. And th this, is where Paul, this is where Peter's going. This is where he's going with this message. What he's saying, what God's about to do cannot happen. It will be hindered unless these things are 
dealt with in the body of Jesus Christ. Anything of prejudice, any member of the body of Christ. Now, we can't forgive the, those who sin against God. We can't forgive those sins. We can't cover those sins. But, but he said, I can't move. The Holy Spirit is, is, is going to come in a great rain upon this earth. He said, it can't happen in a church. It can't happen among a people where there are those that are holding grudges, when there are those who say they love one another, but they can come and they can worship, they, can, they, they, they say I'm a part of the body of Jesus Christ here, and, and yet they come week after week, week after week, and they have not forgiven, they've not forgiven somebody who hurt or wounded them. They've not hurt, they've, they've not resolved this issue. It just stays there day after day and week after week. And, and the Bible says we're not only to forgive, but we're to cover the sins of those who sinned against us. Now, it may have been a wife or husband, a divorce situation. It could have been a, a church uh, a whole group that wounded you and hurt you. It could be an individual or a group of individuals. It could be a husband, a wife. It could be family. And there are those sitting in this church now, and I say it with love and, and compassion. I'm telling you, this will hinder what God is going to do in the church. It's going to hinder what he wants to do in your life and in your home. This has to be dealt with. Is there anyone that you, you have a difficult time forgiving? You say, well, I've forgiven, but I can't forget. Well, then you haven't forgiven. The Bible says, and, and this love that God expects of us is so vast and so all-encompassing. He, he said, now, you not only forgive but you do everything you can to cover their sin. Don't broadcast. And this is what happens. Somebody grieves us, someone wounds us, someone rejects us, and we tell it everywhere. We get on the phone. I just have to get this off my heart. You'll never know what they did to me. And we name names, and we, we name places, and we go, we go down deep into this pit. And then we say, I, I'm only telling you this so you can pray with me. I'm only telling you this because I'm concerned about them and they may lose the touch of God for what they did to me. You should be more concerned about whether you lose the touch of God because you didn't cover the sin. I can cover anyone who sins against me. I have that authority. I have, in fact, I'm commanded to do just that. And that's what the Apostle Peter is saying. This love, you want to be ready? For all things, you'll be ready for the coming of the Lord. You want to be ready when the bottom drops out of everything? You want to be ready? Make sure that you have nothing hindering the flow of the Holy Spirit. There's something wonderful coming. I don't want to be left out. If you have wounded me and I don't know about it, if you talked about my, me behind my back and, and you wounded me, I, I, I'm glad I don't know, but I forgive you. I don't, I don't. I can't name a grudge I have against anybody because I know what happens. I know I lose the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and I know that, that I, have, uh, I have roadblocks. I've got stumbling block in my life. You should be able to sit in this church today and, and, and go over in your memory of, of that thing that is in your heart. And some of you are visiting here. God's speaking to you too. Who is it? Who is it that you have such a hard time Getting that out of your system, you, I just can't. I talked to a pastor recently, a group of ministers really hurt him, and, uh, and I was aware of the situation, hurt him deeply. And I, I talked to him, he said, you know, Brother Dave, I, I've been preaching for years, but I just can't forgive them. I can't do it. And he said, my wife will never forgive. And she was in deep bitterness. This, this, he said, you want to be ready? There's a context here in which, a wide context that 
Peter's talking about. He, he's seeing something coming, and he wants the church to be ready. Now, if, if all, all you want is for God to give you food and shelter. Now, as a father, I want that for my children and grandchildren. And, and, and I want him to provide all my physical needs. He's promised to do that. You see, Peter didn't go there. He didn't go there about advice on, on physical preparations. He didn't go there because, you see, he knew poverty. He knew what it's like to not have a, a cent, a shekel in his pocket because the only money he had at times was, came out of a fish's mouth. This man had one change of clothes. He had one pair of sandals. This, this man had proven God's faithfulness, so that wasn't an issue with him. That, that, he can't even imagine Christians not believing that the Lord would provide. I've been down that way. He said, this is the preparation I want you to talk about. I, I want you to focus on. There's an issue here. I, I, I want you to look into your heart. And I, 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 you're to love even your enemies, the scripture says. You know, Jesus didn't give advice on how to prepare physically other than in Jerusalem. He said, when you see the armies coming, flee from Jerusalem. You don't find him that. He, he says, don't give any thought about tomorrow because it's going to take care of itself. And I'm going to take care of you. Don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, or what, how you're going to be clothed. Don't give it any thought. You won't find Jesus going there. You won't find Peter going there. You don't, the apostle Paul doesn't go there. They had proven God. And you have proven God already. You have proven God faithful up to this hour. He's never failed you yet. He's brought you out of every situation. He's taken care of you financially. You are not in poverty. You have a roof over your head. You have food on your table. And he's going to see you through. <sighs> All right, I want to go. into this matter of the Spirit coming down. And this is, this, this is the context in which Peter is speaking now. He said, there's a great rain coming. You'll find that uh, all through the New Testament, you find it in the prophets especially. There's a prophecy in the Old Testament that there's coming, there's been a former rain and there's a latter rain. The Bible talks about two rains. And, and Moses told Israel, he, he said, there can be no harvest unless there's a latter rain. The first rain, the early rain, came in the spring. And it watered the seed and the blade and the grass or, or, or the forming of it. But he said that it comes uh, before the harvest, before the full grain of corn, there has to be another rain. It's called the latter rain. Now, years ago, there was a... Uh, uh, Pentecostal movement called themselves the latter rain. Now, some say they got in. I don't know all the circumstances or the, <clears throat> the history of that movement. And they said it went into error. But they, they, they had a truth. They had something from the heart of God. And I believe he's going to restore this truth to the church of Jesus Christ. Moses said there's an early rain, but there can be no harvest until there's a latter rain. Here's, here's the scripture. He will give you the rain in your land in due season, the first and the latter rain, so you may gather in the corn, the wine, and the oil. He said, you'll have, you're going to have a rain that uh, ripens the harvest. And beloved, the early rain came at Pentecost in the upper room. That was the rain that watered the seed of the word, that, that watered the message of Jesus Christ, and it began to grow and spread. But now, folks, in the last days, when the world is trembling and gross darkness covers the world, there is no way Jesus would come without. Now, he can come at any moment, but he promises there will be a latter rain. And he says, ask Rain in the time of the latter rain. We're to ask rain, the prophet said. You're to believe God and ask him and believe that this latter rain is promised in the scripture and that it's to come. The prophet Zechariah saw the outpouring of the spirit in the last days. He said, ask ye 
the Lord reign in the time of the latter rain, and the Lord shall make bright clouds, and he will give you showers of rain, and everyone shall have grass in their field. Everyone shall have grass. There's going to be a harvest. He said, the field is going to be ripe. Jesus said, they're white unto harvest. Now, Satan knows this. He knows what is written in the scripture. He knows that there's a tremendous, incredible outpouring of the Holy Spirit before the harvest. And he's going to come against the church of Jesus Christ, knowing what is coming. He saw what happened in the early rain. He saw the, the growth of the church around the world, every kindred and every tongue and every nation. And uh, he saw the power of the Holy Spirit. He saw what happens when the Holy Spirit comes down. And so in the latter rain, Satan knows what is about to happen. Folks, there, there, there's, there's no way that the Lord is going to take his church out of this world limping and broken and fearful and just broken in spirit and mind and soul. No, 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 no. He's not coming and allow Islam to take over the harvest. He's not going to let anybody. The harvest is his. The harvest, the Bible said, is the end of the world. And we've come to the end of things. We've come to the beginning of the end. Now, I don't know how many years. I don't, I'm not going to go to the prophet, prophetic times. I don't know that much about what happens after Jesus comes. I've, I've not been a scholar in that at all. But I know from what I'm reading in the scriptures, and the more I read, the more my faith rises. There is a coming outpouring of the Holy Spirit beyond Pentecost beyond what happened in the upper room. But you see, Peter knew what had to happen. In early day Pentecost, they had what they call waiting on the Lord. They, in the upper room, they waited on the Lord. Now, they weren't waiting just for a calendar date. Pentecost was fully come. But God was doing something. He's doing just what Peter's talking about. There had to be forgiveness. Peter had to be forgiven. Because he wounded the body of Christ. He wounded every one of them. And, and there had to be an outflow of love in that upper room. And God's dealing with things. Peter could not stand up there and be anointed of the Holy Ghost. He can't stand there if people later, some of the apostles, uh, and there's James and John who, who had boasted they were better than the other disciples and had this pride. And they're sitting there. They have to be cleansed. They have to be forgiven by the body of Jesus Christ. And their sins have to be covered. They have to be able, those men have to be able to look at Peter later when the Holy Spirit gives him the authority and he preaches what the Pentecost is all about. And there can't be something in their heart was, well, who made you the leader? Who made you the pastor? Who made you, who gave you this special anointing? No, they sat back. They didn't care who got the honor. They knew the Holy Ghost was there and they were covering. Nobody dare speak against Peter because Peter is safe now in the house of God. He's among people who don't blab what Peter did. Nobody's talking about it in this upper room. They're talking about the Holy Ghost and they're getting free because they're loving, they're forgiving, and they're covering. Do you understand where Peter's going? He said there's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and he comes only to those who are prepared. They were prepared in the upper room. Oh, folks, I still believe on waiting on the Lord. Yes, the Holy Ghost was given, but there's something about waiting in the presence of the Lord where he's allowed to deal with these issues in our heart. And so we can have this forgiveness and we, we, we can have this strength and power. It takes power to forgive. It takes even more power and grace to cover somebody's sin after they've wounded or rejected or hurt you. And God wants to pour out his spirit in this church as we have never known or seen. He, he wants to save multitudes. And he's going to do that. But first, he's coming to purge his body. He's coming to cleanse. And he's not doing it with a rod or a whip in his hand. He's doing it through brokenness. 
and a humble word, a, a compassionate call. Don't let anything hinder the glory of the Lord that's coming. Don't let anything hinder the moving of the Holy Spirit in your family. Don't let anything, don't, don't be a hindrance to the work of God and what he wants to do. Oh, if, if you belong, if, if you worship here at Times Square Church and you feel this is your church home, God help us all, help me, help every pastor, help everyone in the choir and orchestra and everybody in this body to be able to walk through these doors and sit here and raise your hands and worship him and you know there's nothing there between you and the Lord. There's no hindrance that your heart is open. And if, you, if you've been sinning, if you failed God, you come to the blood of Jesus Christ. Folks, the blood has never lost its power. And I have to believe that he will give us through the power of his blood. It, the cross is not in vain. It's not been in vain. If there's not a, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in these last days, why was there an early Pentecost? Why was there an early rain? And look at all these, all of these many years since the first outpouring, the early rain. Do you mean to tell me that the, the Lord, when we need the Holy Ghost the most, when we need the Holy Ghost to survive daily, when we need the power of the Holy Ghost to be his witness, when, when everything is shaking and the darkness is here, we have got to have an anchor. We, the Holy Spirit comes to reveal Christ. He comes to dig deep into our spirits to make us vessels made worthy through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And what Zechariah said is, wake up, church, the Holy Spirit and the glory is going to fall upon nations. So many people feel helpless. But folks, this, this can't be worked up. This is a prophetic word, and you have to allow and ask the Holy Spirit to increase your faith, to believe and stand on his word. Haggai stands before a discouraged people. They're, they're remembering the glory of the old temple. The old tabernacle is gone. And now God is doing a new work. And they're, they're building a temple now that seems so insignificant to what God did in the past. And, and they're standing, they're weeping. And the prophet Haggai, I think is in a chapter, he says, uh, I see you looking at... The, what God is doing here now. He said, some of you lived then, who was 60 to 70 years apart, and some of them are still living. And when they were young, they saw the glory of that first work of God. What a great work God did back then. You hear that a lot about the revivals of the past, what God did back then. And all oh, the glory we had and all the wonderful meetings we had and people got saved and we tarried half the night and, and that's wonderful. Thank God. Thank God. I have those wonderful memories hidden in my heart. And the prophet looked at these people downcast and, and looking at that and, and, and he, he says, who's left among you that saw the house in its first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison as if it's nothing? Do you understand what this is saying? Some of us who walk with God for years, we remember the movings of the Holy Spirit. We remember the great things God did. But the prophet Haggai says, now, look at now, nah, you're discouraged and you, you, you think that this is nothing and that, that we are you're, we're just waning in zeal. The, there's no glory left. And, and we, we've been overwhelmed, overwhelmed with the darkness. We've been so overwhelmed with what is happening. We get overwhelmed at the fury of the devil. We get overwhelmed of the homosexual uh, militancy and, and, and our courts making laws that 
we don't agree with and never asked for, never voted for. And we, we get overwhelmed with the fury of Satan among us. We get overwhelmed with the darkness, overwhelmed with the thought we've sinned away our day of grace, overwhelmed with fears and doubts. And that's what happened. They're saying, in their minds, they're saying, well, this is nothing. We have nothing to rejoice about. God's not doing anything. This is so insignificant. Oh, Haggai says, fear not. And God said this in Haggai 2.5. My spirit remains among you. My spirit is still at work. And then he turns to the people and says, I'm telling you, the glory of this house is going to be greater than the first house. The rain that's coming is greater than the early rain. There's a latter rain. So take away that frown. Lift up holy hands because the rain is coming and God's spirit is moving. And I'm not going to let the devil let me be downcast I don't want my eyes on, on what God is doing to say it's so insignificant. America has not sinned away its day of grace. The world has not sinned away its day of grace. The revival is just begun. The rain is beginning to fall. Hallelujah. <laughs> I got so excited last night. Because I was reading in the book of Revelation. He said, first the blade, then the ear, and then the full corn of the ear. See, everything's ripening now. And the scripture says in Revelation 14, 15, thrust in the sickle and begin to reap. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. And then I, I went on and I read this in Revelation 14, 14, the verse prior to what I've just read to you. And I, I got so excited. I, I went into the bedroom. Gwen was retiring. I'd been in my study last night. And I said, Gwen, I'm, I am shouting inside. And I walked back and forth in our apartment down the street. Behold, he comes in a cloud. A crown on his head and a sickle in his hand. What's a sickle? It's that long harvesting thing, got a big sharp blade on it where you just mow down the harvest. And the Bible says of our Christ, hallelujah. He's not there just hoping the saints will hold on. He's not there surprised at the darkness. Behold, he comes in a white cloud. Say it with me. A crown on his head and a sickle in his hand. That makes me want to jump. A crown on his head. Say it. A crown on his head and a sickle in his hand. Folks, it's harvest time. On Wall Street. In the Bowery. Uptown, downtown, New Jersey, and all over this nation and around the world. Glory to God. It's harvest time. It's beginning to rain. Hallelujah. Do you believe that? Will you stand? Do you see what Peter's saying now, folks? Remove everything that hinders because the glory is coming. Like you've never seen or know or experienced the glory of the Lord. And you know what that glory is? The manifest presence of Jesus Christ. We will know his presence as we've never known it. We will know him as we've never known him. And people are going to be open to the gospel. He's going to melt hard hearts. And many others he's going to bring through 
calamity where they have no place to turn but to God. And we will be ready with a message of hope and not despair. Now, in prayer, I asked the Holy Spirit how I was to close this service. And it's simply this. The Holy Spirit made known to me, I don't know how many, but in the overflow balcony here in the main auditorium, there's some of you here that have a hindrance. This thing has become, uh, has a stranglehold on you. It's a root of bitterness, a root. And that root has to come out. And it's dug in and you, you don't want it anymore. You want to be free of this. You've carried it long enough. And I believe God hears when we pray, if we agree together, two or three agree together concerning anything on earth, it shall be done to the Father in heaven. And I want to pray with you. I want God to remove that hindrance, but you have to want it. You have to humble yourself. That's right. Humble yourself. You're not caring what anybody says or thinking. There has to be something rise up here that says, I want to walk out of this church today free. I want to walk out of this church without this chain on me, without this burden. You, you have felt and seen the agony. And if you don't forgive, it's going to come around. And whatever you did comes back in like manner in another way. And you face it again and again. Face it now. And let the Holy Spirit bring you to a place of victory. And free you. And you'll know a freedom and a joy like you haven't experienced in a long time. Uh, Greg ministered to us for a moment in song. And I want you to just step out. If you don't know Christ, you can come now. And he'll come and reveal himself to your heart. And change your life. If you've been drifting away from Christ, if you're backslidden in your heart, follow these that are coming. And the balcony up there, just go down the stairs on either side and come down these aisles and main turn come. Just humble yourself and say, Pastor Dave, I want you to pray for me. I want freedom. I don't want to carry this burden any longer. I know that takes a lot of grace, but it's that important. It's life and death. That's it. Just follow these that are coming. Help me to know that you are near. Do you know that he's near you right now? Do you know he said, my spirit is with you. The Holy Spirit hasn't left you. The Holy Spirit brought you down to the aisle to the front of this church for prayer. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. You begin there thanking the Lord for that. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for loving me and dealing with my heart. And look this way for just a minute. You took a humble step, boldly to step out and acknowledge your need. Now, you're among friends. You're safe in this house. Nobody's wondering what your problem is or who you have a struggle with. Nobody's thinking that. They're just anxious for you to come through to victory, come through to peace with God. Will you pray this prayer with me before I pray with you? Lord Jesus, I do humble myself and I come to you for forgiveness. Lord, I have a problem. I have this root in me. I'm asking you to pluck it out. I'm asking you to forgive me and help me to forgive and cover the sins of all those who have hurt me. Lord Jesus, I want to be free. I want to be free right now. So I cast this in your feet. I give it to you. Cleanse me. In Jesus' name, I receive healing of every hurt and every root to be plucked out. Now let me pray for you. Lord, I know you hear when we pray. 
I know you hear when we cry out to you in our need. And I pray, Lord, that you do that by your spirit right now. Just move in and among us. He said, I'm among you. I, I, I am with you. He said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And Lord, we come fearlessly now. We come boldly to the throne of grace. And we ask you, Lord, to help us to face this and say, I don't want it anymore. I don't want anything unlike Christ in me. I want to be free. I want the glory of Christ in my life. I want the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I need a new baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I, I, I need this from you now, Jesus. We need to hear from you. Cleanse and sanctify. Change us, God, by your Spirit. Holy Spirit, you have come down and you are breathing on this church and you're breathing throughout the land. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, just raise a hand or both hands to the Lord and say, I believe. I believe, Lord, right from your heart. I believe you, Lord, for cleansing and healing. Nothing between my soul and my Savior. Nothing between. Hallelujah. Now, you can be free right now if you receive by faith the word of the Lord. You can be free. <laughs> Beloved, we are, with this I close, we are delivered, we're set free by the word of the Lord. Yes. Accepted and believed by faith. If this is your church, and, and if, if, this not, if you're visiting from another country, if you're visiting from another church, uh, just go to your pastor and say, Pastor, I believe a rain's coming. I, I believe there's a great harvest. And I want to be one of the first to start praying and believing in that direction. Spread the word. Hallelujah. Folks, God's about to shut down every so-called revival that features the flesh. It's all coming down. They're not going to be able to afford it anymore. The, the money's going to dry up. And it's going to be genuine. You're not going to have any stars. You're not going to feature any preachers or evangelists. It's going to be ordinary people, just like you. Just like me, just be ordinary people. And it's going to be people and pastors that step out of the way and let the Holy Spirit do his work. Hallelujah. <laughs> Wonderful. <clears throat> Would you turn to two or three people and say, it's going to rain? It's going to rain. I want you to believe that. 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 that.